Okay, good morning, everyone. Before we begin, we'll take a quick tour around the Connect meeting room on the screen in front of you. Please note that we have now turned on the recording function for archiving and playback through the CIDR website at cider.athabaskiu.ca. You are now being recorded. Beginning in the top right, you'll find a list of participants. Note in particular my name, Daniel Wilton, under Hosts. If you hover your mouse over my name, you'll see a pop-up allowing you to send me a private chat message. If you run into any technical issues during the presentation, feel free to send me a note. Below the participant list is the chat area. Note that the chat is public and is recorded. Here you can post comments and responses to some of the more informal questions that might come up during the talk. It's also an opportunity for the microphone shy to post questions in the Q&A after the presentation. The main window is, of course, the projection screen for the slides, and above that you'll find a button showing a person with a raised hand. That is the pull-down menu with options for making the session a bit more interactive. You can give a smiley, applause, and after the presentation I'll release the microphone and open things up for a Q&A. Button will appear and you can grab the mic walkie-talkie style to ask your questions. And here we go. Good morning everyone and welcome to the third session of the CIDR 2015-16 season. Last month we heard about a massive open online course or MOOC and the opportunities and challenges of new directions or new structures for learning. Today we continue our exploration of innovative programs with a look at a series of modules designed specifically to help teachers navigate this rapidly changing world of technology and new educational structures in blended and online learning. Connie Blomgren is an assistant professor at the Center for Distance Education at Athabasca University. With 25 years as a teacher in the Alberta school system from grades 3 to 12, she now brings this experience to the development of this new program for K-12, along with research interests in visual culture, digital storytelling, and technology as pedagogical practice. Laurel Beaton joins us from Alberta Distance Learning Center where she is coordinator of learning resource development and partnerships, working to develop a network of collaborative relationships between teachers, post-secondary institutions, and community partners to create innovative learning experiences to support online, classroom, and blended learning. Our third presenter is of course a familiar name for our CIDR audience. It is nearly impossible to introduce new directions in distance or blended education here in Canada or abroad without including Marty Cleveland Innes, Professor and Chair of the Center for Distance Education at Athabasca University. If you visit her faculty page at the CDE, you can scroll through her recent history of active research projects, but bring a lunch, it's a very long list. Before I go, please note the date of our next session on Wednesday, December 2nd. That session is still open, so be sure to watch our site at cider.athabascau.ca over the next few days for updates. If you have recent work of interest to our audience, contact me. Your name could be in this space. In January, you can look forward to a session from our friends in Europe on grading soft skills, known as the GRASS project. Following that, we'll be moving into a spring of learning analytics and other good things. We're now beginning to finalize our spring sessions and we'll be making announcements soon. So visit us again at cider.athabascau.ca for the latest information. I'm now passing the microphone to Marty Cleveland Innes to begin today's session on Bolt, Blended and Online Learning and Teaching. Note also that the slides are posted on our site where you'll find a recording of this session available in about two hours. Feel free to use your applause buttons here. Everyone, welcome Connie Blomgren, Laurel Beaton, and Marty Cleveland Innes. Good morning, and can you hear me now? <laughs> I will uh, trust my audience here to let me know how my, my volume is. Thank you so much, Dan, for your kind introduction. 
and I, I, um, I appreciate this opportunity to introduce this project to you, but I, I will do so quickly because my comrades, Dr. Connie Blomgren and Laurel Beaton, are the mainstays of this project and um, are, have a lot of things to tell you about this exciting new initiative. I want to just give you a little bit of background on how it is we landed in this particular place to be offering this program. Three things occurred in combination. I won't say simultaneously because it did take some time for us to get to this particular spot. One of the first things that started to happen probably five to six years ago now is we began to get regular requests, both at the Alberta Distance Learning Center and in the Center for Distance Education at Athabasca University, from practicing teachers for professional learning opportunities to become involved in blended and online learning. And at that moment in time, neither ADLC or the Center for Distance Education were set up to do this kind of professional development slash professional learning. However, we did begin to put our heads together to talk about uh, what, what the needs were and began to meet regularly as consultants to one another to see how we could meet this burgeoning need in, the, in our environment. We, um, we eventually came to a spot where we realized one year um, we were able to count 1,400 requests from practicing teachers that came in with no advertising, no marketing, nothing, asking us to do something to help them learn more about how to be teachers, facilitators, uh, to make good use of the technology as appropriate learning environments in the K-12 system. So the next step then be, uh, was for us to begin a, uh, some sort of process to design such an experience for practicing teachers. Well, we all know what the Iron Triangle of distance education is, and that is it has to be accessible. It has to be um, both cost effective and cost available. So the costs have to be appropriate for the audience, and they have to be uh, they have to cover the costs that are going to occur as the program is created, and um, they have to be of the highest quality. There be no compromise in any kind of um, in any kind of learning engagement because you are using a distance environment and all the technology that now goes along with that. Well, we finally came to, um, came to a place where we were able to say, we can take the graduate courses that we offer in our certificates and our master's program and carve them up into modules that would be appropriate for professional learning. That gives us two advantages. The first is the one that's near and dear to my heart and I think critical as we move forward in education. When we are offering professional learning, especially around something as important as changing pedagogical forms, we need to do so in a way that is evidence-based. That means that these teacher practitioners also can benefit from the opportunity of becoming practitioner researchers. Many are already doing such things. We want to help them in this professional learning environment also um, use those practitioner researcher skills to make sure as they make their changes to move into blended environments that it's all being done carefully, thoroughly, and with the soundest of evidence. Um, the, the, the other thing that we wanted to create was the opportunity for people to take this professional learning experience and translate it into credit for graduate programs if they so 
chose to do so. Um, so you can, in this program, take the, um, the credits that you get from the modules and trade them in for advanced credit in our certificate, uh, our certificates, diplomas, and our master's program. The launch has occurred. We're running a pilot through the Alberta Distance Learning Center. You're going to hear all about that today. And we go public in January. We're very excited. We've had great success so far. And I will turn it over now to Connie to begin to tell you how it's all worked out from the designer and the teacher's point of view. Hello, can you hear me? Um, I'm just going to go through um, some of the slides that um, Marty has touched upon, and here this is where I'm going to begin. Um, as Marty said, as Marty said, um, we have been working hard at trying to trying to develop the best possible program and I apologize for my microphone. I think it's my mic. I um, will do my very best. I'll speak as loud as I can and I apologize that it sounds like a tunnel. So there were two questions that we looked at. Um, how can the certificate address the needs and how will we continue to address these needs? The bulk curriculum um, has uh, been developed with the policies of the Alberta government in mind. As you can see, Canada is a national leader in K-12 education. And educational reform has been ongoing for over a decade. Specifically, the learning and technology policy framework in 2014 was an important part. Additionally, the individual professional program of teachers and the position papers developed by the Alberta Teachers Association. Specifically, the policy direction says that the teachers will read, review, participate, and work with evidence-based practices to sustain and advance innovation in education. The outcomes are, of course, to stay current, to participate and to apply research to learning and teaching, And to use data systems and evidence-based reasoning to monitor and support student-centered learning. So this is not just about teacher learning, it, this is also student learning with technology. Additionally, um, the professional learning policy of this uh, learning and technology policy framework says that teachers may apply maintain and apply so that they may use technology effectively and, and use it for their teaching and for the support of student learning. Additionally, they need to have a different uh, digital skill and be able to uh, use technology and research to design personalized student-centered learning and as well as to engage in their own professional growth through different venues, including technology, social media, and communities of practice. Uh, professional collaborations are also supported through the communities of practice research and the development of learning communities. 
and we will continue to address the professional learning needs of teachers through uh, research that is continuing to be explored, surveys, downlining, use of their participatory um, aspects, observations um, that we make as the modules are in progress, and to pursue research and theory as it directly applies to their own lived experiences. I pass it over to Laurel. Good morning, everyone. I hope that you can hear me okay. Um, welcome, and thanks for having us today. Um, I get the honor of discussing about how we've taken up this work. So uh, Marty has talked a little bit about, uh, thank you for letting me know you can hear me. Marty talked a little bit about what brought us to this place and how we came together as Athabasca University and the Alberta Learning Center, um, and what the need was that we realized there, there were teachers across Alberta and obviously across Canada and the world are being asked to take up this work of using technology thoughtfully for learning. Um, and it's very difficult to know uh, what type of professional support they need for that work that they're doing. And so through this program, we really try to um, answer that question. And, and um, I think Connie did a good job of showing the documents that come from our Alberta government that require teachers to take up this work. So a little bit about how we've come to do this. This is sort of the symbol. So we started with the theoretical framework of the community of inquiry and many of you that are here today are probably well aware of this theory especially if you um, live and work at Athabasca University or have taken up this research as part of your um, study but uh, we really believe in it and so as the frame for how we designed the bolt program we kept the community of inquiry in mind um, we really wanted to hold true to um, a balance between social presence cognitive presence and teaching presence and we thought that this was not only important for the courses, but it was essential for the teachers themselves to understand this framework as they were moving into live and online learning. And we thought that the best way for them to know of the importance of community of inquiry was to experience it themselves. And so the both modules are designed with this um, theoretical framework in mind. Um, in redesigning the courses, we were very fortunate to have courses from Athabasca University that already existed in the graduate studies program and we had the great gift of being given those courses and being allowed to um, look at them, read through them, evaluate them, and then take the lens of what here is essential for K-12 teachers taking a blended and online learning, um, maybe what's missing um, in terms of things that are relevant to them. And so we took a redesign process where we were able to redesign and reconceptualize a course that already existed. And in the process of doing that, we broke one graduate studies course into three um, micro courses or course lets, and we're calling them modules today. And so, so we really had um, the task of trying to manage the content volume. So when you take a graduate studies course that is usually studied over the course of a semester, and you break that into three smaller pieces, um, one of the biggest things we've had to look at is what is the level of content volume that teachers can manage over a four-week span, which is what these modules or microcourses are running at. Um, and then we also had to look at, in a shorter period of time, which is our four-week modules, how do you create a learning community um, so that the participants can know each other, trust each other, and challenge each other in their thinking. And so uh, of our course redesign design planning, how to take up these three challenges and opportunities. So here is um, just a little overview of the first course that we've broken into both modules. So we started with the originating course in DDE 621 from Athabasca University, which is online teaching and distance education. And we looked at the core content and we broke it into three modules, which we are calling Bolt 671, 672 and 673. And we have currently piloted 671 and 672 with a group of teachers from the Alberta Distance Learning Center who have volunteered to be our pilot group. 
for our guinea pig. And we are about to begin bolt 673. And so you can see we took the content that existed in the originating course and we grouped it into three modules. And we tried to really work with what content worked well together um, for the four week module. And here's just an example of how we took up that work of dividing up the elements of the originating course and chunking them into the bulk modules. Um, one thing that we wanted to be sure about is the idea of a professional uh, learning network as something to support teachers as they continue this work. And so um, rather than have professional Hi everyone, I hope you can hear me now. I apologize for that. I really, really am not sure what happened there. I appreciate your patience though. Um, thanks Dan, if you did some miracle working behind the scenes there, I appreciate it. Um, so what I was saying here was the, the notion of professional learning networks and how we thought that we would really want the learning that happens in the BOLT program to continue and exist beyond the course. And so one way that teachers can feel supported in that is through professional learning networks. And we very much didn't want that to just be taken up in one session or one module. We wanted that to endure throughout all of the Bolt, Bolt offering. And so you can see here that the topic of professional learning networks and how they can be taken up um, is going to run throughout all of the Bolt offerings. Try to advance my slides without any hiccups here. And so some of the learning experiences and assessments were things that we really um, took time and care to pay attention to. From the originating courses, there were talk of, you know, online learning as it exists in, in K-12 environments, but there was also talk of training and that um, sort of distance education. And so we tried to uh, redesign the learning experiences so that they would be things that teachers would feel um, spoke to their professional practice, maybe had them take up some of those wicked challenges that exist within K-12 of education and would allow them to become, um, as Marty discussed, practitioner researchers. And so one of the things that we, we know is that teachers in K-12 education are constantly collecting data and analyzing the experiences that their students are having and their success with their different approaches to learning, um, but they don't always see themselves as researchers. And so Connie has done a fabulous job of um, putting into the hands of the teachers in this pilot of both uh, research that they can hold outside their practice and say, what does the research say about the way I take up my work of teaching and my students learning and how can I be supported through research and how can research challenge my thinking as it exists right now. And so we really tried to have learning experiences and assessments that aligned with um, that idea of practitioner research. Um, the next couple of slides are just examples of the courses. So the next course that we will be working to pilot is the MDDE 3 
foundations of instructional design, system analysis, and learning theory, which sounds hefty, and Connie and I have are beginning that work of looking at this course and again going through the same process of course redesign and determining what best fits into each module and uh, how to align that to teachers' needs and uh, student learning in K-12. And then the next course that we will do will be the MDDE 620, which is Technology and Education. So if people have questions about content of they can definitely ask that towards the end of the, the session, but this is just to give you an example of how the courses were broken up. Uh, and so as Marty mentioned, we have been piloting since August of this year. We've had a pilot group beginning to go through the bulk courses, and we have many observations from that experience. Uh, one of the things that is most interesting is this idea um, that teachers are very motivated to do well despite how busy they are. They want to be great students and so they put a lot of pressure on themselves to um, to be exceptional and and not to just be sort of good enough and there's a lot of uh, I think stress around graduate studies um, even if it's taken up in this way where it's professional development, professional learning or graduate studies. Um, I could speak to this a lot, but I think Connie has something that she'd like to say. Connie, do you want to take over the mic about the pilot observations? I can jump in me to keep going. Um, I can speak to them a bit, Laurel, and then if you want to add after that, and then if Marty has some additional comments about the observations from her perspective. Uh, you're right. Um, in this um, observation that as we have been working through the pilot, we can see that uh, there is our expectation as instructors and designers, and then students coming in, in this case teachers, and how they have an expectation of how it might be, and of course their own experience with delivery models through the ADLC and um, our delivery of courses through AU, and especially with this, these modules, there is a three-week synchronous component. And so during that time when they are working through the module, they are feeling perhaps quite a bit of uh, pressure in a short burst of time. And so their expectation might be uh, somewhat different from what their lived experience of teaching in a distance education environment is like. Additionally, um, these modules have also been carefully designed to fit with the K-12 teaching year. And so they do not begin at the beginning of September like many graduate programs. Uh, it's at the end of September that the um, modules begin. And it's on and off for um, an extended period of time. So the first module actually began in middle of August, no, beginning of August, and so it was intense at the beginning of August, um, then again at the end of September into October, and then we'll be beginning again our third module in mid-November here, just going into the beginning of December. The teachers have two weeks early access to the materials, then there's three weeks of synchronous online activities, and one week when they may complete their assignments that are essentially offline. So the intensity is really just in that three week period, but as we know, K-12 teaching is intense almost all of the time. And so this requires that, of course, that they need strong time management skills and I find it very interesting as the instructor how there has to be this process of allowing themselves permission uh, to ask for not just help but to ask for an extension. And as teachers, of course, they often receive those requests. But now when they are the student, there has to be this time period when they go, okay, I think I should ask and they give themselves permission. And that also that some of the work will be com completed adequately and not to the most 
highest level if they had all the time in the world. And there is so much material uh, that, of course, they sometimes feel like they're drinking from a fire hose. And it's interesting that the least confident student going into the module tend to be the most successful, I guess, perhaps because they're so committed. Um, uh, from the discussion in the online forums, there is a, a real engagement with the content and the research articles and transferring it into their own practices. And there's excitement about what it means to be a digital, digital teacher. Also, there's this affirmation that their current professional practices are, in, are actually quite in line with some of the findings from the research. So they are sometimes doing things correctly, but not knowing so. And then when they see it affirmed in the research, their confidence increases. And also their ability to explain their professional practices to their students, parents, administrators, um, the broader public, all of these audiences now are able to hear why teachers are making the choices they are making and also how it ties back to the best of the research. Uh, there has been some a desire by students to audit, especially some of the students who have already hold a master's degree, but it may be about 10 years old and so they feel that they need to be more current in their professional knowledge. And yet, they don't want the credentials because they have them already, but yet are interested to participate. Um, this is somewhat different than a MOOC, of course, um, and also currently many of the MOOCs being offered are more for teaching in higher education. Lastly, what Laurel and I and Marty have been discussing in great detail is this idea of trying to find the middle ground of professional learning versus um, traditional professional development for teachers. And so it is this um, redefinition of uh, teacher professional development and an emphasis that it is an ongoing uh, evolution that is um, something that needs to be re-examined as technology changes but also as the digital pedagogy changes. And so this is where BOLD is intended to help the participants to become lifelong learners, especially through the um, professional learning network and the various um, topics that we're asking them to take up and to continue to observe and understand in their own professional practice, even once they have finished the courses. So I'll pass the mic over to Yes, thank you. I think I would just like to address some of the chat that's been happening on the slide just in case other people weren't, you know, maybe paying attention to the slides and not to the chat, but there were some questions about the design. So I just want to take those up a little bit just to make sure everyone's clear. So the way that the BOLT modules are designed is that if a teacher um, sees something being offered in BOLT, say it's BOLT 672, and they see that that would really align with their professional learning needs, they can come to that course and just take Bolt 672 as a standalone. It's a self-contained learning experience. There's no requirement that you necessarily have to have taken 671 first and be prepared to take 673 after um, in the way that traditional graduate studies is designed. I'm in a graduate studies program right now, and if I don't complete X number of courses by a set date, I am in trouble in some way. I will be penalized or have to pay extra to stay enrolled. This is not the intent of BOLT. BOLT is intended that if a teacher just wants one of these modules, they can come to that professional learning and say, that's what I needed for right now, and I'm good, and they can be done at the end of the four weeks. Alternatively, if a teacher says, I want something more than that, I want a sustained learning experience, they can enroll in 671 and then 672 and 673. And that combination of three modules together then would be equivalent to one graduate studies course that they could um, go for advanced um, credit towards Athabasca University's uh, graduate studies program. And so it's, uh, I think what Connie was saying about this middle ground, it's professional development 
um, and professional learning if that's what you're looking for, but it can ladder into graduate studies if you are ready for that and if that's what you're looking for. Uh, one of the biggest observations we've had is about this idea of auditing. You know, we, we thought when we were designing these courses that there would be a very strong desire from K-12 teachers to come into this professional learning opportunity uh, because it provides the ability for some graduate level credentials or, you know, courses towards the graduate studies program. And yes, there are some teachers that come to it for that reason, but there are just as many who come to it looking for no credentialing and are actually not that interested in um, being formally assessed or getting a grade or having something to necessarily put on their resume. They just want the learning for themselves and for their students. And so I think that's something that we're wrestling with, this idea of what does auditing mean, uh, what type of participation is required for you to, to be a part of these modules, and how do you assess someone who is just there because they want the, um, the research and the, the readings and the professional dialogue versus someone who's there because they want to be assessed as they plan to take this and ladder it into a graduate studies program. So we still have some wrestling to do about that, but the beauty of this design is that it, it really is the middle ground between professional development, which we see as professional learning and it's ongoing, and graduate studies, and that the two can be married through both. So uh, that's just some of our observations at this time. There are many, many more. Um, Marty, I don't know if you want to jump in from more of a leadership point of view, uh, what, what you're observing from this experience so far. Hi, uh, just a couple of comments. I um, I can't I, I can't emphasize enough how often now um, I get we get in the Center for Distance Education um, requests and questions about how all of this needs to take place. So. Um, the, the questions that you've raised here about, you know, how does this work, how does it fit for teachers, how can we make it as, as accessible as possible, how can we make it graduate level learning while at the same time meet the needs of, of teachers who really just want to learn about their practice. And we're working very hard to, to construct a way to do that so that that practice is well considered and evaluated and based on evidence and research findings. I, I have to tell you, I just, um, a couple of things. One, I can't, I, I don't know how to explain to you the demand on this. I, I virtually ran from one, from a course that I'm participating in teaching in, at an a university outside of Canada to help their faculty move into blended and online environments to come over to help with this presentation. And in between that, I got a message from someone about a recent Forbes report that identifies how strong the demand is, this in this case across North America, for this kind of blended and online learning of very high quality. And the report suggests that the current blended and online learning that's going on, particularly in K-12, is not meeting the quality standards that everyone wants it to. So that's more grist for our mill to say um, what we want to make sure of. And we are now negotiating with the pilot group. It's valuable to have these, these teachers in who are giving us feedback. We have very much constructed a, a community of inquiry with this group to help us make sure that the modules themselves and ultimately the courses that they ladder into will meet their needs as practicing teachers and researchers and meet the requirements of graduate study as well. I, I'll get the link to this Forbes report and I'll put it in the text box for you. And I'll, I'll say again um, how much we all have to applaud 
Connie and Laurel's work in this area. They're really creating something that's um, uh, really first of first in quality for t professional learning and graduate study. Uh, and how what a great job they've done making sure that um, they're developing something that will be most valuable to teachers in this area. I think, uh, thank you, Marty, for that. I think that was a very good summary of what we're attempting to do. Uh, just a point to Connie mentioned that her and I were able to present at the Blended Learning Symposium that was just held in Edmonton in the past week. It was the first ever um, in Alberta, and it was with K-12 teachers as a focus who are taking up blended and online learning. And we presented this presentation basically. It was quite similar to this. And then we took up um, a piece of learning with the, uh, with the group and showed them the community of inquiry framework and asked them if they had ever experienced this before. And of the room of, I think, Connie, close to 70 people were in the room, only two people in K-12 who were in present at that time had uh, heard of community of inquiry or had taken that up. And so we introduced it very preliminarily and then had some discussion about what this would look like in online learning in K-12 environment. And the teachers were just overwhelmed. They were, they, they appreciated having research to guide. They're thinking about practice. They um, were very interested in learning more. And I think one thing as myself coming from K-12 and being a K-12 educator is that our government and our leaders often call on us to take up, um, to apply research to practice, and as we should. But teachers in K-12 uh, learning don't often have a lot of access to research. It's not usually put in their hands. And so I think one of the things that Bull is really attempting to do is to, um, is to foster that practitioner research piece. Research piece and to give teachers access to quality research and have them hold it up to their practice and ask questions of themselves and of the learning that's happening. So I think um, that was very appreciated at the symposium where we presented at, and people were very grateful to see Athabasca University present um, there and willing to engage in dialogue with teachers. And so I think that was a great experience. Laurel, there's a question here from the University of Calgary Taylor Institute, um, and they're asking, are the portions of Bolt modules available online? Can you um, say some more about what you mean? Do you mean you can you go in and have a look at what's being offered, or um, are you interested in having them available at your institute? Maybe you could say some more about what um, what you're interested in. It looks like the request is just to see the modules from the University of Calgary Taylor Institute. So that's a question for the Minister of Distance Education, I think, Marty, um, about that access, if other people could see them. Uh, I, uh, I think that it would be a great opportunity for us to, we can uh, we could come to you and show you more specifically what goes on in the modules. We we don't have the latitude, of course, to give you access to actually go into Moodle and click around, although we could do that with you if, if you're interested. We'd be quite happy to show you what, um, what uh, we're doing and how the modules are divided up and what activities are and so on. There's all the privacy issues if you wanted to see what actually happens with the students, but we could show you the shell and uh, show you what they look like in our Moodle environment. We'd be happy to do that. So obviously we've just moved into question and answer, which 
just fabulous. I love how it just happened naturally. So please, the questions coming in. No, you can access your microphones, I think, as well. If you'd like to maybe just put your hand up. But I'll just go to the next question that's in the chat. And it was um, from Wendy. Is it difficult to find instructors qualified to teach these modules? Um, again, that's a Center for Distance Education question. But currently, Connie is the instructor, and she is also a professor at Athabasca University. And so as it stands right now in pilot phase and going in to the public offering it is the professor from the Alaska University who will be the instructor and so I don't know if that will change in the future but that's how it is at the time and there was another question about how they're offered and Connie answered that it is fully online but we do have synchronous Adobe Connect sessions usually with a, a special guest who presents on the topic so Marty was our first special guest thank you very much, uh, Dr. Cleveland Innes, for speaking to Community of Inquiry um, in our Bolt 671 course. Keep the questions coming. We're happy to answer more. There's a question about the cost um, and the um, so the cost is one third of the cost of a graduate course per module, but it is uh, based on our research. It's in line with what teachers would normally spend on a professional learning course. So it's um, it's about five hundred and thirteen dollars. Um, there's no application fees. There's no extra student fees. That includes all of the materials. There's no nothing to buy beyond that. It's uh, that's. The, the beginning and the end of the cost. I'll just say quickly uh, about the instructors. It's a good question, Wendy. Um, it is we require two things of an instructor that we would allow to teach the Bolt modules. One, because you do have the opportunity for it to ladder into a master's program, that teacher has to be doctoral prepared. Um, the second requirement is that they have experience in K to 12 classrooms uh, as well, and and thirdly, of course, they have to have experience in teaching in online environments. So we require those three things. And um, yes, it is a big call. We're so lucky to have you, Connie. And uh, we also have uh, another. Oh, we have a few professors that have K to 12 experience who are also doctoral prepared. Um, that would be able to support this program if necessary. I'm going to jump in here orally. It's Mary McNabb. Um, just a comment, Marty, about the cost of the courses. That's about comparable to going to a two or three day conference. So uh, from a teaching point of view, that's really good value for your money. My question is, uh, when you open this to the teaching public, uh, so talking about people who aren't necessarily working in distance education all the time that may have been asked to teach one course and don't know a lot about it. Are you expecting a gap in um, facility with technology? And I'm asking this because uh, my, my experience with my colleagues when I was teaching full time was that my understanding of what it takes to be learning online and use blended learning was very different from uh, my colleagues who thought that they were just right up on everything. And that wasn't really in sync with my experience. Thank you. So um, Connie, you might want to answer this. So Mary, I think what I what you're asking is, um, how is it that we very quickly get these um, our participants who want to learn about online but have never <laughs> have never learned online before? How is it we prepare them to participate in this in these modules in the most effective way? Um, Mary, that's a good point. Um, I think it's all obviously going to be something that we're going to have to. Um, see as we make the modules public. 
that because the current offerings have been with a private group with the ADLC, these teachers are very tech uh, aware and have integrated a lot of technology into their different teaching practices. So with this particular group, they are very tech savvy. That said, I think it's been quite interesting to um, see that I would say in the last five years, there has been this um, big wave of technology take up by many teachers in the K-12 system. And at the Blended Ed Symposium, I noticed how the designers of the um, symposium had worked to create a very interactive and dynamic keynote presentation, one that I've never witnessed before, even though the, uh, the week before I was at a conference in Palo Alto, Silicon Valley, with um, people that are very tech savvy, and yet um, the actual conference itself, in some ways, was not nearly as in, in our interactive or dynamic as what I saw at the blended symposium. They were using Google Docs and they were um, allowing people to collaborate and share their notes on the keynote speakers and the different presentations. And it was very um, interesting to just see how the K-12 world is taking up um, technology integration. And it's not just about tech ed. This is about digital pedagogy. This is about thinking through how do we use the tools we use and the reasons why. So it's, um, you know, in the TPAC model, there's an emphasis on the technology. But there's also the emphasis on the pedagogy. And this is where the community of inquiry also comes into play because, of course, it allows teachers who are always about relationships with students to take their technology and to um, humanize it. So of course we're going to have some of the people that apply that aren't very aware of what to do and we have to think through how we can support them. Um, I think that K-12 teachers are becoming more and more adept at using the, the tools and in fact, I think some of the most interesting applications of technology integration are, are happening in K-12 classrooms. Good to hear. Thank you. There are lots of really fabulous questions happening in the chat. So I'm going to just back up a little bit because I don't want to miss a few that were from earlier on. So. Christy and I think uh, someone else asked if these could be utilized with college level teachers um, or post secondary. And I, I really don't see why not, um, with one caveat that we really did design them with the K 12 teacher in mind because we saw that as a need at the time and that was really the focus. But um, would the issues be the same? Would the research be similar? Yes. What we ask often in the BOLT program is uh, because much of the research is actually done at the post-secondary level, there is very limited research in K-12 education, whether it be about face-to-face -face instruction or, or online in particular. Um, we're often showing our teachers research from post-secondary and then asking them, how does this apply in a K-12 context? Um, what's appropriate for your learners? What, you know, what is the difference here between andragogy or pedagogy? Um, what do you need to be attuned to as a K-12 teacher? And so, would the boat modules be appropriate for college teachers? I think so. Connie and Marty might have other thoughts on that. Uh, I agree that they would be valuable, certainly when this the course that is the foundation for the bolt modules is offered in the master's program. We have um, a range of educators participating there. Um, with K-12 and college and post-secondary, as well as military workplace, religion, and so on. So the, the only difference I would say, I, I would like to see Bolt for college, for post-secondary college and university teachers created. Because part of what we want to accomplish is creating a community 
of practice and um, relationships among the people who participate in the modules to support the implementation and their development in it, uh, ongoing. So there's value, I think, certainly for anyone who took a BOLT module who is interested in the pedagogy and the transition that occurs for learners and teachers when they move from face-to-face -to, -face to online. That said, I would like to see us keep this BOLT um, for teachers in K-12 to and expand the offering if we, we see the need um, to, to post-secondary and college teachers. So I wanted to say um, for Maria, Maria had a question earlier, Laurel, about assessment issues. And I wonder if, Maria, if you could post that again um, or grab the mic and ask. Laurel and Connie, what you wanted to know. And I think well, Maria's typing along the same lines. Todd had a question about um, what our thoughts are around someone who just took one of the modules as opposed to all three in terms of their depth of understanding. Um, he said they're doing some work in British Columbia about breaking learning into modules but have questions around retention and mastery. So just wondering what our thoughts are. Probably very similar to Maria's question about assessment. So how do we know what they know? Um, Connie, do you want to take that one since you're the, the assessor? Okay, I, I was reading the chat box. <laughs> Sorry, can you ask me that again, Laurel? Question is around how the assessments. I think in particular there was a question earlier on about um, how do we deal with the assessments in these courses, and then Todd had a, a question similar about how do we feel about people who take one of the courses rather than all three? Um, what's their level of retention and understanding um, when they break it up like that? Okay, I'll address some in that order. Assessment. Um, well, many of the teachers, I think, are very proficient in their ability to write and to explain their ideas. And so, you know, the use of the APA is probably the area that gives them some stress. But I'm also um, aware that they are just entering into um, graduate studies. And um, so just as any student, even if they had applied for the um, full graduate program, their first course, they may find that their APA skills are something that they need to continue to develop. So we have some tutorials. Um, we've asked the library to give them orientation. And I am very, um, I always want to give lots of support to learners. And so I make sure that there is lots of content. And I reach out to students and give them suggestions as well. So the assessments are, I think that they feel that they're doing well in their assessments, and they are. The challenge, of course, is not to make them too heavy and to try and stay true to the weighting and value that would come from a regular graduate program. So um, actually, Laurel and I have talked about that many times, and we have stripped back and put some emphasis on reading and discussing, and then writing, and then so the movement is sometimes away from just submitting a paper. They don't have time to write a really strong paper as much as they would like to. So um, we chunk uh, so that they are building toward a final paper, so that when they get to the actual paper, they've done quite a bit of the preparation and have, and have had that marked in, the, in advance. Um, moving to the second one about the retention, I think because of the pressure lives of teachers teaching in K-12, um, they are, if they just dip into something and do what they can and then they leave, that's how um, somebody stays in the profession for a long time. You um, take what you can, work with it as much as you can, and then you might have to uh, leave. 
and they come back when you have more time. And um, so I think that that's also reflective of how much of our learning is now going to take place as we need it, when we need it, take what we need, and then come back when we need more. Yeah, I agree, Connie. I think you did a good job summarizing that, um, Todd, just to that end. I think you sound like you maybe are in K-12 as well, and I am, and I'm responsible for teacher professional development and growth in my school, and um, there are teacher professional growth plans. And so often, the professional development that they take up or that we offer them is one and done, come for the day, and don't discuss it much longer after that. And um, I think teachers are tired of that and they're realizing that they need something that is more sustained. And I guess what's good about both is that it's both. So you can take one, but it's four weeks. It's not just one day of someone telling you what you should be doing. It's four weeks of you thinking about your practice and holding it up to um, what the research says and what your colleagues say through that professional discourse. And yes, you can leave it after that and come back, you know, in six months or a year or not at all. So I think it's that middle ground between one day workshop and full graduate studies commitment of two or three years of your life. And so I think the goal is to provide something that is a bit deeper and richer than maybe what we're currently offering, but not overwhelming and responsive to the pressures that teachers feel around their practice and their level of work. I hope that answers that question. Okay, and as we start to wind down our regular hour, um, I do want to make sure that we say thank you to Connie Blongren, Laurel Beaton, and Marty Cleveland Innes for a very interesting presentation. The slides uh, will be available at cider.athabascau.ca and a recording in about an hour. So we can probably squeeze in a couple last minute, very short questions and uh, our, our guests will be starting to leave. There was a question earlier on, and I'm not even sure if the participant's still with us, about how we're rolling this out to teachers across Alberta. And that's a really great question. And when we struggle with, um, we have gone to the Alberta Teachers Association Summer Conference and presented to the professional development chairs that represent their school divisions. And so if you are a K-12 teacher or you're wondering where this information is, your PD chairs have some knowledge of this program. Uh, we presented at the Blend Ed Symposium for that very reason. And there is an ad that will be going out shortly in the ATA newspaper. Um, so that's one way we're trying to get the word out, but we'd really appreciate you sharing the website, sharing our emails. If you think there's people that have questions or would like to know more, we're definitely here to uh, respond to that type of request. So thank you very much for your interest. All right, and that link again in the chat box is cde.athabascau.ca slash bolt. And a reminder again that our presentation room will be moving over the course of the next month. So do keep an eye on our site, cider.athabascau.ca, for updates on that. All right, it looks like we're starting to wind down now, so I will turn off the recording function now.